I also want to point out that we have a floating hour on February 20th. So I'm just gonna put that to all of you. Um, we do have a webinar planned, but there's a, an hour sort of floating unaccounted for um, that I want to talk to all of you to decide how we wanna spend it. Perhaps you use that hour to catch up on something um, on your own time, or perhaps we use it to cover something that you feel we really haven't dedicated enough time to yet. So please um, put that uh, under your hat for a while and think about how you might wanna spend that um, hour on the 20th. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, let's talk about project management. Please share some takeaways or some questions from um, that unit. Um, I was impressed by all of the templates that were available. I think that I, we're, I'm not at a point where I'll be needing those, but I've never worked on a project that required that kind of clarity of um, just the editing process back and forth, exactly what um, you expect the instructor to do with their book at this stage. So I think those are extremely helpful when we get to that point. Great. Thanks, Adam. There was a lot of information here, um, and until I get to that point, I'm not sure what I'm going to be using, but like, for instance, I, I know that peer review is the one book that I um, know that there's a manuscript for peer review is one of the questions, and so there's now a whole lot of suggestions I can pass on to this author on, on um, you know, peer review options, and, and they actually do have funding for peer review and it seems to be in line with what, what it should be. So that, that was good. But yeah, there's a lot, and this whole vetting thing, I think I had a different concept of what vetting was. But, um, so these are like lots and lots of checklists of what needs to be done. Is that, is that how I understand it? Yeah, I mean, I'll turn things over to Elvis on vetting specifically, um, but we also um, don't want to uh, concern you that you have to grow your expertise so that you can vet all of these things that mm -hmm. are in the vetting list. This is kind of one of those kitchen sink examples where we're just showing you, um, we're showing you everything that is vetted in, in the production cycle, but we're not saying like you need to figure out how to do this. Right. So like a couple of weeks ago, we talked that I uh, talked about project management in the sense that there's a lot of stuff that you have to do right in the beginning. Uh, this sort of handles it. And like, and like Karen said, it's like, we're just giving you all the information and that's there as a resource. It doesn't mean that, for example, if a project doesn't need copy editing, then, you know, you can sort of put aside the copy editing vet part, although it might be good to look at it and say, oh, look, this is a good question uh, to ask. So for example, if you noticed in the, in the module, vetting is divided into uh, the different tasks that are involved from, from a project's beginning all the way down to uh, a project's end. So when you look at vetting, where, what, we de what we define vetting as, let's call it, let's say, that, let's say that, what we define vetting as is taking into account everything that you may need to know for a project and sort of handling it as early as possible because, and we'll hammer this, um, you know, on throughout uh, the courses, but it's better to take care of things earlier on. Um, I think there's a question. Um, what is meant by editorial tolerances? So uh, what we de uh, define as editorial tolerances is really something that you as an institution um, define. So for example, let's say a, you don't want any misspellings, you know, in your, in your open textbook, but uh, let's say capitalization, which sometimes might you know vary uh, depending on the institution, that's something that you can set yourself. So within editorial tolerances, when we say that, it's like okay, you're looking at this book and you're thinking about copy editing, and you see that you know the author constantly capitalizes the word co-op, for example. Uh, then you can say okay, you know that's not something that we're going to concern ourselves with, and you can actually include that as a as part of almost like uh, a style sheet that you can send to 
uh, the copy editor or that, you know, you can, you yourself can keep and say, okay, I know I'm not going to worry about the fact that this author is capitalizing this, even though it's not normally cap capitalized. Um, so yeah, editorial tolerances are something that you define to say, this is up to where we're going to copy edit. For example, here at Scribe, we have different levels of copy editing, um, light, medium, and heavy. Um, and as those, um, designations sort of say a light edit is really looking for spelling looking for very light errors uh, we're not worried about like the actual content if you will meanwhile um, something that's heavier will have us look at the files and say okay like this sentence needs to be completely changed and we're gonna go ahead and change it and give you that as a suggestion rather than just leave a comment for the author to change so I hope that that answers um, that question and also answers a little bit about the betting. Uh, if I can just jump in. Um, I know that those vetting checklists are really dense and overwhelming. And I just, one of the things we say at Scribe is we pride ourselves on never screwing up in the same way twice. We always strive to make new and interesting screw ups. <laughs> and one of the ways we achieve that is by our vetting checklist being living documents. And so what you're seeing is the result of years and years of our mistakes and how we could have prevented those mistakes if we knew about them earlier. Um, and so that's why they're so dense and overwhelming. And that's essentially what vetting is, is, is looking at what you have, uh, looking at uh, what you know of is going to be required for this project and where the gaps are between those two things. So that's the purpose of all that, that those checklists. Thank you both. Are there other um, questions or clarifications before we move forward with project management? I just want to address um, Marilyn's uh, question about the digital hub. I provided a link. It's there in the chat. Uh, we will be talking about that um, a little bit more later on. We're not going to be focused too much on that during um, project management, although I do know that in the vetting spec, it says like upload this to the digital hub and see what it gives you. But once we talk a little bit more about vetting, we'll talk about the digital hub in more extensive terms. Thanks. So today we are fortunate to have two people from the first cohort to share their experiences, what they've uh, learned. And um, uh, I would now like to introduce uh, Carla Meyer and Kathy Labadorf. Um, sorry, I, one webinar after another. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to <laughs> keep, my, keep my wits about me here. Uh, as, as lunchtime slips away. Um, but yes, Kathy and Carla are both here, and so they can share what they've learned, as will Elvis in his role working with authors. Um, so now I'll, I'll turn it over to them to kind of uh, make sense of what you learned about in your unit and for you to ask them and engage them um, around questions that might be on your mind. Carla, you're unmuted, so let's start with you. Okay, that works. Um, so if you were just in the webinar, first off, thanks for attending. And second off, I'm going to repeat what I said there, communication, communication, communication um, from both sides. I think starting off clearly communicating, here is what we are offering you. Here is what we can do. And when we get people who say, hey, I'm kind of interested in this, I say, fabulous. Let's find a time where I can come over to your office and sit down and talk about you, talk about this with you more in depth. Because it's not an easy conversation to have via email. It's so extensive. So I'm like, great, you know, I'm in your office. Tell me about this. What caught your interest? What are your plans? You know, do you already have a manuscript in process? Do you have an outline? So kind of getting a feel from where they stand. Um, and then I'm going to talk you through each step. So it's, it's, I had one person who's like, you're here. Now, when do I start? I was like, oh, first you have to fill out an application. Um, so Fill out an application. I'm happy to review your application because I don't make final decisions. That goes to a committee to make final decisions, but I can help them um, make their application as strong as possible. So 
here's what you need to do to even get into the program. Once you are in the program, here is our timeline. Um, you know, here is the total timeline. Here is when chapters will be due. Um, here is what I can offer you. Here is where I may have to say, you know what, I'm going to have to bring in Scribe to answer that question for you. Um, I just try to put out there as much as possible. And um, after that kind of, hey, where are my royalties um, talk, I now talk too about, I want to make sure you very understand very much understand this is open publishing and I sell it from the perspective that you got to keep your copyright this is yours here's all the amazing things we can do about it and you know we're providing you with an honorarium because we realize how valuable your time is and that you're probably going to be doing this on evenings and weekends um, and the great thing with a Creative Commons license is is there could be ways that maybe they commercialize it down the road but I am now making it very clear this is not a commercial type um, this activity is not commercial. And that if you are in this for royalties, the guy who I talked with, he's like, but you know, with royalties, I have a son who's going off to college. I thought this might help. And I'm like, go find a publisher, get those royalties, put your son in college. Um, you know, it's, 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 this just isn't the program for you. So talking about what the benefits are about retaining your copyright and things like that. Um, so once a project starts, Communication. Um, I, I think it's the fine line of not wanting to be a pest, but also checking in frequently like, hey, how are things going? Um, one thing that Karen talked about um, that I'm probably going to start integrating is you are required to meet with me a couple times so we can sit down and talk in person. Um, I love that idea and I've been going with kind of the gloves on approach that I don't want to be too in your face, but I can tell you as an editor, you have to be there and sometimes you have to make the um, contact out to them. And the one thing I tell every one of my publishers, every one of my authors, excuse me, from the get-go is talk to me. Things come up. Um, I am in the process of publishing a book myself. It is now um, about one and three years quarter in the one and three quarters years in the making when I'm supposed to have it done in one year. And I, I told my editor, it's not that I'm sitting at home eating bonbons. It's, it's that you think I'm going to work on it this evening and then something comes up at home or you set aside a day at work to work on a chapter and you know 50 people show up in your office and tear you out of your office and make you go to horrible meetings um, when you think about what you could actually be getting done. So I tell the authors, life happens. Your priorities will change at work and that if you talk to me, I am more than happy to adjust our publication schedule accordingly. But if you don't talk to me, I have to assume that you are not meeting the requirements of this program. And um, it, it's, I don't want to get to the point where we have to boot you out for non-communication. Um, one story, uh, and this is from me being a journal editor, I had an author who I was really excited to work with. They stopped talking to me, they didn't respond to a series of emails, they didn't respond to my phone calls because apparently they knew my area code. So at one point I picked up my cell phone, which has a very different area code, and I called them. And they said, hello, this is so and so, and I was like, hey, it's Carla. And if you can hear, hear somebody's intent over the phone that do I hang up now and run away or do I actually talk to her, I swear I could hear that decision being made through the phone. And they said, I'm so sorry. Let me tell you what's been going on. It's, it's you know, I had this at work and then I had this happen in my personal life. And I was like, dude, that's okay. Like these things happen. Where do you want to go from here? Do you want to keep this original publication deadline or do we want to move it? He's like, but I thought you were going to yell at me and that's why I haven't been calling you back. And I'm like, I'm not going to yell at you. Things happen. Just talk to me. Um, so being as proactive as you can about communication, making sure your author feels very comfortable communicating with you too. But as a journal editor, I can say there are some points too where I reached out to authors and said, you know what, at this point, we just have to let your manuscript go. And you can come back at another time when maybe you're less busy and we can re-examine this again but also realizing that there may be points where it is not your fault. Um, and maybe they're not, maybe they are intentionally, you know, beating around the bush. Most of the times they're not, but um, lots of great communication on both sides and uh, realizing too that sometimes hard decisions need to be made. But um, as being a journal manager out of the over 50, actually more than that, probably closer to 100 articles that we've published in our journal so far, one. I've had one author that I've had to drop. Um, and I never heard back from them again. So it's, it's that flexibility, too, that we talked about, flexibility in timelines and flexibility that not everything's going to work out, but that's okay. 
And listening to Carla, you know, one methodology that you could consider once you've selected your projects is to use that um, MOU creation contract mm -hmm. that Creative Commons, Rebus, and OTN collaborated on. You know, get it, get it into shape to reflect, you know, your program and how you're going to run things, but include the, you know, CC BY requirements, kind of all of the necessary points along with um, whatever you decide will work best locally. Make sure that general counsel or whoever needs to review it and approve it at your institution has done so, but then really sit down in person with the authors who you're going to support and kind of line by line go through it and say, you know, this is what this means. This is how this is going to work. This is what you're signing. Um, and as Carla and Karen Bjork talked about in the previous hour and at other times, um, you'll probably say many of those things more than once. Um, a lot of times there's a gap, you know, Carla mentioned around the royalties question, someone thinking that that was going to happen with an open textbook, or even a gap around, um, you know, permissions, uh, what an open license means. Um, Karen Bjork, I know, does like a faculty author workshop where everyone who she's going to support throughout the year, um, they come together for a workshop, they get you know, education on the open licenses, on, you know, how things are going to work within the program, what Scribe's going to do, um, and then, you know, they can build community among the authors, and then she kind of has that chance to um, answer questions uh, collectively. And then I recommend, I think we talked about this last week, um, having, having your own schedule, you know, markers on your Google Calendar or whatever calendar system you use that says, you know, check in with author on this day, Otherwise, you know, it's just one of those things where it's kind of back here and you know it needs to happen and then suddenly four months have gone by and you're not sure where things are and are maybe embarrassed, you don't know where things are. I just think that regular um, communication schedule can, can help and you can preview it with the author and say, you know, I'm gonna be in touch with you, uh, you know, on this regular basis and, you know, it's not to pester you or scare you or yell at you. Um, it's really just to see like where you're at and how I can support you. And to tack onto that real quick, all these post-it notes you see on the wall behind me, that is my system of keeping track of things. Um, I have reminders on my Google Calendar, but I'm a very visual person. Um, this here is one issue of JCell right now, and I can instantly tell what stage of the process is every um, article in, what am I expecting back from a particular author, and what day. And um, it's it's somebody told me if you watch Homeland they're like wow like Carrie Matheson did that and isn't she crazy and I'm like okay I don't know if that was a compliment or not <laughs> but um, it's this is what works for me after three years of publishing a journal this is what works for me and I can promise you as our books will be launching there will be a tab for everybody who's involved on this up in my wall so I can visually and instantly look at this and know where everything is and it looks good Thanks. I mean, it thanks. Looks serious. Yeah, I like those colors. Th that was my response to the person who called me Carrie Matheson. I'm like, no, her wall was much more messy. Um, <laughs> but you know, if it meant I got to hang out with Damian Lewis, you know, you can call me Carrie Matheson. So, sure. Kathy, what would you add in terms of your um, project management lessons learned or techniques that you recommend? Sure. Can you hear me? Okay. Is it working? <laughs> Uh, yes, well, um, so I'm a slightly different uh, lower level of experience uh, than both Karen and Carla, and so I've learned a whole lot of things along the way, and uh, it's, it's okay to learn things along the way because you're learning something. And I jumped into this, uh, I jumped into this publishing opportunity because our provost had given awards for um, faculty who would like to create textbooks for large enrollment classes, open, CC BY uh, books. And uh, we didn't have a publishing house, and I, I, I think I've said this before, but I was thinking, who's going to publish these books? You know, and I guess I probably, maybe I didn't have to take on this responsibility, but I felt like this would be a really great adventure uh, for me, for us at UConn, to, um, to take on these books. So um, that's why I just love to learn things and it's just was my thing. So uh, what I wanna say is that um, when Karen, when OTN came up with this, it seemed like an answer to a dream come true. Like, wow, this is, this, we're gonna be able to do this. There were, we had three books 
that um, some of the other uh, grant winners had already written a book already or done something else. But the three, uh, three, three books that we had were one in physical chemistry, one in probability from the math department, and uh, one for pre-calc. Uh, for non-math people <laughs> from another author. So I think we've kind of lost the pre-calc book, but that's because he was all, he's a young guy and he wants the money and he's really creative. And I think he says, hmm, well, maybe I really should go with a commercial publisher on this. So I said, well, two books is enough for OTN. That's what they said. It was two to three. I said, I know I've got two. So the first book we had was the physical chemistry book, I had gone into his office like December of 2016, 2017, and uh, to talk to him about it, to talk to him about the OTN progress, and uh, face to face, because I am a face to face person. And as a matter of fact, in December this year, I had a phone conversation with him because I needed some stuff done. And he actually got quite upset with me because I was kind of, you know, forthright. And he's an Indian man and perhaps doesn't expect that. I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but, but we worked it all out. So everything's fine. But sometimes you do have to speak uh, plain English to your authors, as we've heard from both uh, Karen Bjork and, and Carla in the last, uh, last session. So, um, so he showed me a stack of papers that was about two inches high. He said, there's the book right there. It's the start of the book. This was uh, January of 2017. And what I come to find out was what that is are the transcripts to his lectures with all the images from the PowerPoint screens. And he had used his funds to, to hire graduate students to transcribe the lectures. But he, so, so um, I didn't realize it really was kind of in a very, uh, unfinished state it really wasn't done he hadn't really done it it was just a compilation he's been he's been teaching this course for 30 years um, so he's got a lot he knows what he wants to say um, so as we're going along he got me uh, it was great to work in this scribe uh, the with scribe on the co-op because they got me thinking about pedagogical uh, the pedagogical points that you want, you know, you want to make sure your book has looks like a textbook and has the features of a textbook and, um, you know, the consistencies of a textbook, the kinds of uh, images in there. So we were working with the first module, which was about six chapters that he'd actually done a lot of work on and Scribe had helped a lot too. So then when Scribe gave me feedback, I went and gave him feedback and he was going, oh, yeah, these are great ideas. You know, so he, he then really um, took that feedback and ran with it and changed, uh, made sure the, about the consistencies and made sure about, um, uh, about the active learning parts, because there are many active learning parts in this particular textbook. Um, and along the way also, we, uh, we started to form our uh, local experts. I had the accessibility people come that are here at UConn in the accessibility office. And we talked together. And we talked together about images, because many of his images were um, charts and graphs, you know, scientific images. And, and he, you know, when he did this in class face to face, he didn't really worry about that. There were several blue lines and none of them were, you know, they were all straight lines. And, and and they, you know, they brought to mind that we need to be able to describe these images for the alt text. So maybe we need to use a dotted line. Uh, if you use a dotted line and a straight line, then they can both be green. But you can say the green dotted line and the person who maybe has a, a color deficiency or is blind is thinking that the green dotted line is ascending and the green uh, solid line is descending. So there... It, we also had to reimagine those images again so that the uh, so that they could be described in the alt text because accessibility is really really important it's important to OTN and it's important to us so um, so that started uh, a lot of thought between um, <laughs> the thing that can, let me let me back up a little bit um, and that is that when when I had shared the chapter with Scribe, 
they were somebody was remarking about oh, these lines don't really match up here you know this this chart that this doesn't come here you know the the and started seeing some messiness to some of the images that work fine in in powerpoint screens up above but you're gonna make it real in a book and it's got us so um at that time then we decided we needed to get someone here to redo all the images and so i hired one of his chemistry students who was going to put them uh redo all these images nice clean set and so we had the accessibility people so we thought about colors we had the uh, scribe people complaining about that that they don't line up you know and so they made the images now are fabulous and they've been turned into vector images and uh they're just gorgeous there's a few that aren't done yet and this is a 500 page book okay there's a lot of images and um and i thank sunny for asking the question also last a couple of weeks ago about formulas and I thank Elvis for answering the question about formulas I did not realize that we would need to do an alt text for all those formulas of which there are over a thousand so um, that that is something we may ask scribe to do I don't know if you can do it but um, uh, so so we we started uh, along with the uh, accessibility people we were we start reaching out to the uh, instructional design people here because we're librarians and my team of course as i mentioned before i have someone who has uh, uh was an editor of journal articles and someone who also likes the adobe products and has a lot of uh, um, experience there and we work together on the book so Locally, it's nice to have a group of experts that you can call upon. So if you can develop now your uh, people who you can reach out to at your place, um, that's just another alternative and sometimes a lot easier. So um, with VJ, I, uh, we, I think he was right in there with uh, CC BY. VJ is a person who says education is a birthright, but even VJ, a few months later, he was saying, uh, you know, I don't know about this CC BY, you know, um, maybe, maybe we should talk about that. But, but I simply just put on my social justice hat, which is because that's what I believe. And I told him, you know, as, as uh, um, how I felt about CC BY, and I, it was fine with me if he was going to take it away, you know, if that, that's his option, his academic freedom, it's not my decision. But I wanted him to feel comfortable with the fact that, the, yes, we're going to do this. And so we said, oh, I'll always be poor. We might as well just keep it CC by. So we're, and he's good with it now. He's really fine with it. So, so uh, the CC by, there was a little bit of uh, back and forth, did have to meet and talk. The, um, the images again, uh, still the images were not quite as good so that was a whole process too so we uh, we finally gotten there when I got you can always reach out to the mic it would be now because it was Tim before who uh, knows the the kinds of you know 300 DPI is that right or do you want 600 you don't want 600 300 okay and uh, for for things like mathematical graphs it's got an SVG or an EPS and so we we got those in so that they could get as big or as small and um, we had to move you know some of the images have there's three so there's an a b c you know and in the so you, you have to then move the a outside the box and make make the image so that's all one so that when you have it on a on another device it doesn't separate the letter from the image so there's a lot of cool really fun stuff um, that you learn and I'm enjoying it very much so um, so th again this is me starting from absolutely nothing and I never even had a cataloging course in library school but um, do uh, the Chicago manual of style is a Bible when it comes to this stuff so if you have that um, that really helps with so many um, issues in in this kind of uh, publishing so let's see editorial tolerances as I was looking at the this is the what project managers do um, 
from the handout and um, peer review is right now I've got the whole manuscript oh yes so he got me the whole manuscript he said I'm just not gonna live in January I'm just gonna do the book so he just spent hours and hours and hours doing the book because it takes a long time and uh, this was after he got angry with me for that conversation in December but um, now he's got the book done he's got it all in his Apple and he's using it for the class and in an email he wrote to me I am having immense joy teaching the PCHEM lab this semester after 30 years. So, I mean, he's, he's really happy, okay, that he, that he just said, he just put himself down and got it. So there were lots of other um, things along the way, but I think uh, the, having the, the local team and having to reach out the community and, uh, you got to learn those little details too, um, unless you want to have pay somebody to do them. But I, I don't like to pay for something unless I know I really can't do it. I want to be able to know I can do this, but I'm making a choice. I will have them copy edit. I will have them do the design because we're, we're having fun with it, but it isn't anywhere nearly as nice as what Scribe could probably do with it. So I, I, I will probably be in touch. But there's a lot that goes on in that one year. Our, the one thing I did learn for sure is that when my second book, the author came, he's, it's a group of authors, and he says, well, well what, what should we do next? I said, well, you contact me when the book is complete. <laughs> don't, I don't want to hear anything from you until you can hand me the manuscript. So that's something I learned from BJ. But um, if I hadn't, if I hadn't taken advantage of what BJ's already done, then um, I wouldn't have learned as much. And Scribe used ours as a, a model for some of the classes. So it was it was a a win win situation as far as I'm concerned. Thanks. Thanks, Kathy. So to compare and contrast what we heard between Carla and Kathy, Kathy just said, you know, don't talk to me until you have your manuscript. Um, and other people may be like, I'm going to stay in touch with you so that I get your manuscript. Um, and there's no right or wrong way. It's, you know, what works best, best for you and your publishing program. I will also said, as Kathy did really about herself, she is someone who wants to know and understand each elements of book production and has been just totally invested in understanding everything from A to Z. Whereas, you know, Carla talked about in the webinar, um, even though she, she has a, a background in journal publishing, she's going to step back and say like, you know, I'd rather um, focus my time on these relationships and work with Scribe to do, um, you know, this very detailed work. So, I think it's two, two great examples of how you may choose to um, run your program or somewhere in between. Um, Emily had a question for you, Kathy, while you were talking. Um, when you were talking about hiring a student to work on the accessibility for images, did you pay for that or yes. uh, did it come out of the initial grant reward? Okay. No, that was, uh, that was paid for by us, yep, by the, our foundation account. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. Um, Marilyn asked me in the chat if we wanted to just uh, touch back again on licenses. I think we talked about this last week or maybe two weeks ago. Um, just, you know, that these conversations with authors, um, as Kathy talked about, um, can be difficult or protracted. Um, ultimately, of course, it's up to them what license they choose for their work. We're not um, here to muscle anyone, uh, but we can share, you know, a social justice angle or um, whatever um, sort of justification or argument resonates uh, most for you. Um, in the cooperative, we are requiring CC BY. I think that requirement warrants being stated uh, once, twice, three times, um, both in the call for proposals. Uh, if you're doing one, you could say, you know, these will be published CC BY. Here's what this license means. Um, you're not looking at royalties, but you may be looking at um, greater exposure. Um, there's really a way to frame it in terms of it will be included in the open textbook library. We have more than 10,000 visitors a day now in the OTL. Um, faculty, of course, uh, will be able to discover and review their book. So there's a lot of advantages um, to that CC BY license that are sort of unique to the cooperative, in addition to the advantages built into the license 
um, regardless of whether or not you're publishing through the cooperative. But there has also been a lot of conversation lately about concerns around um, commercial use of open textbooks, and that is definitely understandable um, to work on something uh, for a stipend or perhaps um, just for a project grant and then think of a commercial entity uh, using it to drive their own profit is probably very disheartening. <clears throat> And so when this, this question has been coming up, and I actually uh, was talking to Cable Green about it a week or two ago, um, asking a very specific question, and that is, and I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, feel free to tell me, um, but the question was, you know, if a commercial entity, let's say Cengage or another um, provider, were to take a CC by NC, so it has the non-commercial license on it, could they you know, use that book on their platform but not charge for it and be in compliance with the license? And the answer is yes, which may not be the understanding of that license as your authors are thinking of it. And Carla, you're the copyright expert, so feel free to clarify or jump in here, but um, that was one of my takeaways from Cable. And so that also could be part of the conversation with your authors in that there's still sort of ways that uh, commercial publishers could use the work even with that NC license on it and that really by keeping the CC by the most open license you're probably supporting and helping your colleagues um, more so than than adding sort of complexity with that additional layer but again totally up to the individual to decide I'm going to stop talking. Um. So I have a few thoughts. I, I agree completely. If it's a CC by NC, they can upload the book as long as they're not charging for access to it and still be in compliance with the license. Um, it, it's, it's, I really believe in CC by. I think more and more I'm starting to believe a little bit in CC by NC. But tragically, there are going to be users out there, including publishers, who don't care what license you put on it. Um, and the reason I say that is I was in an inclusive access demonstration last year and it included a publisher who shall remain nameless and um, they said, yeah, we can also upload OER for a $25 charge per student. Um, we will place that OER in the platform. Thank you, everybody, for like these faces that I'm seeing. Um, <laughs> we will place that OER in the platform students to engage with. And, you know, I jumped in right away and I said, first off, $25 per student, like that is so unethical. It, 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 it's I couldn't even see straight. I'm like, second off, why in the world will we pay you to do that when I could do it for free? And third off, I said, well, what if it's a CC by NC license? Um, you know, that to me sounds very much like a commercialized use. And I, I swear this is almost what the exchange was. This guy was like, oh, no, it's not. And I was like, yeah, that sounds like a commercial use to me. And he said, you don't know what you're talking about. And I said, no offense, I kind of do. Um, he said, and well, we've talked to our attorneys, and they agree that this is not a commercial use. And I said, $25 a head, that's not a commercial use. Um, and I was trying to be professional, but in my mind, what I was thinking is, I want one of those OER textbook authors who put a CC by NC license on their book to sue you because we can fund the open access movement going forward with all the money they would make off you violating that license in that capacity. Um, so what that really demonstrated to me, though, was no matter what license you put on it, even if it's a CC by NC, there are going to be plenty of people out there who are respectful of that. There are going to be people who are not no matter what. And um, I, I think we need to look at, accept that that will happen and it's gonna be frustrating and maybe we'll sue them, who knows. But um, to get too restrictive, to try to prevent some people from doing uses we might not com be comfortable with when some people are gonna do those uses anyway, might be taking it a little too far. So instead to license for what will be best for most people and deal with those jerks on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I hope I said that appropriately. Um, but that's why I still believe in the CC by, but uh, you will also see more and more things that I'm putting forward that has the NC on it, just for that reason. Thanks, Carla. I'm so glad you're here as a copyright expert and you could share um, that information with us. Are there other questions, other things we want to take advantage of uh, Carla's expertise or Kathy's story? Emily? Yeah, I have a question. So I know both of you um, sort of spoke to scenarios 
where you had started working with a, a faculty member um, and then especially with your case Kathy he there was a time where it sounds like you were some amount of time invested in the project and he was considering um, stepping aside and pursuing the um, royalties route that also happened with you though Carla and so I'm curious in the beginning if you had them sign like a MOU um, and if you had paid them any money yet and what how you would have handled the scenario if then after that investment of time and maybe some exchange of money if they had said oh wait I do I want to publish a route where I get royalties how you would have handled it well <clears throat> yes there um, I do have that situation right now as I said with the other math professor who I haven't heard from and um, I I don't know where the provost grant money is and uh, I'm wondering, is there something I should do about this if, if he doesn't actually come through with the project? But um, uh, with VJ, uh, with I think most, it's not that he misunderstood it. I think it's just that he went out and started talking about talking to other faculty about OER and and um, and got a little. And this happened twice with him because uh, one other conversation he had with faculty, they were saying, oh, OER, those are just patched together, this chapter and that chapter. And, and um, so, you know, depending on who he's listening to, but then I have to be the voice of reason. And I was the voice of reason. And I was the voice of social justice. And I was the voice that really got to his heart, you know, which was social justice and that education is a birthright. So, um, uh, I actually can't answer the question about the money because I'm wondering about that with our other author and I don't know because the the provost is gone now he's in Missouri now so um, I don't I don't know what if it's worth doing anything about that Carla um, so I can kind of answer that um, with the first gentleman we were still just in the talking phases so it was very easy there was no contract in place um, what we're doing here is it is our plan to offer our author, authors um, a $5,000 honorarium for writing the book. They will get $1,000 upfront and they will get $4,000 on the completion of the delivered manuscript. Um, and one recommendation I had is not only del the delivered manuscript, but working through all the revision process too and talking about it, talking to us after they give it to us. So um, things that we've talked about is do $1,000 initially, $2,000 more upon the delivery of the completed manuscript, and $2,000 more when it's published. Or um, somebody was like, just hold off the $4,000 till it's completely done. What does it matter? Um, and I said, what may matter is just the timing. They're getting the money, getting the money and getting, you know, getting in increments might incentivize them to continue participating with us. But um, we have thought about that, and uh, that is our game plan is bit by bit. That's a good game plan. <laughs> <laughs> I've thought about that for other ones, but I didn't have any um, power to do that with the provost grant. That was a completely different committee, so I couldn't even suggest it. They just gave them the money. So. Well, and speaking of power, I hope this is appropriate, but um, it's one thing where I can be like, hey, you're not talking to me. It's what's going on. But, um, you know, it's it's since it's the provost office who's putting up most of the money for this, it's uh, they get to deal with the provost office if they take somebody off. I'll try to be the nice person first, but I will also hand you off to them, um, you know, to kind of chase you down. And yeah. I'm quite sure they will more readily respond to an email from the provost. Than <laughs> um, yes. and, Thank goodness we've never had to hit that situation. I hope we never do. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that, that's another benefit of the partnership that we have here is um, people with more power than me that you can call upon if you need to, if you need to chase somebody down. That can be helpful. So Carla and Kathy, thank you both very much for sharing your experience. You're very welcome to stay, obviously, for the rest of the call. I am going to hand things to Elvis and Mike to just talk more about your role as production manager in the production workflow picture, a little bit about timelines, um, we've talked about vetting, but just a little bit more from the project management experience at Scribe. And then as you mentioned, we'll continue this conversation in future meetings as well. So I'll hand it over to them now. So 
I'll start and then I'll, because I just have a couple brief things to say um, about communication, especially as a project, man, project manager. Uh, I'd like to thank Carla mm -hmm. and Kathy because they both covered a lot of what they've experienced in real time and what we here at Scribe experience uh, often when we're dealing uh, with authors. So all I want to say, and then I'll hand it over to Mike to talk a little bit more about scheduling, and, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about betting. Uh, in the next class. So by, by far, this is very brief and we will cover um, things in the next class. So it's not, uh, it's not like this is all you're going to get on project management. So when we're thinking about uh, project managers and us as project managers, what we have to think is that a project manager wears a lot of hats, has to deal with a lot of people, has to communicate with a lot of people. Um, and that really is key. We have to communicate effectively and we have to really make sure that everything we're saying is clear. We can never assume that anything that we tell an author or somebody that we're working with, like a freelancer um, or even just an outside contractor, um, is, you know, they're understanding it perfectly. And this is not to say that, you know, the authors or the freelancers or whatnot aren't capable of understanding. It's just that when we communicate, we sometimes take things for granted. Like one of the things that Karen um, mentioned in the webinar was that when we first started this, we assumed, you know, like, hey, everybody's going to have publishing experience. And we went off on that end and things didn't really work that way. You know, not everybody had publishing experience. There's a whole set of terminology that we here at Scribe take for granted because we're in it um, pretty much every day. So when you are a project manager, what you have to do is you have to always be conscious like, hey, you're not talking down to people. You're not telling them like, hey, you're, you know, you're not getting what I'm telling you. You're just telling them, here's what I need uh, from you, right? Because I want to make this the very best book that you can produce. And this is what you're telling the authors. And that's why we have those templates, um, as Adam mentioned, on the module. Because once you have those templates, you can modify those to the very best um, you know, circumstances that you have the very best situation. So for example, if you're dealing with an author that has, um, is not using Word, they're using open office because of whatever reason, we've actually had that happen. There are ways that you can work around that, but if you communicate it effectively right in the beginning, you'll know that ahead of time and know that you're gonna have to put something in place uh, before you're sending files back for them to review during copy edit um, or when, even when you're receiving that completed manuscript uh, from them. So uh, communication is really the big important part about being a project manager. We often serve as the ones who are interpreting this information and then communicating it to um, another set of people or anything like that. So when we are speaking to our authors and we're telling them, what you really want to do is you want to say, hey, I'm going to be you know, contacting you a lot, like Carla said. And actually, I would say, um, I would rather pester. You know, I would, I would go down that road and be like, yeah, I'm going to email you every week and I'm going to tell you where your project is and you're not going to have to ask me a single question about it because I'm going to keep you informed. I think that that um, approach works best because sometimes, you know, an author may be wondering, oh, I wonder what's going on with my project after it's left my hands. Um, and when they wonder, then they might think that things are going wrong or anything like that. And if they're out in the void and they're not really willing to reach out to you, if you reach out to them and you say, hey, look, this is where everything's at. You don't need to worry about this or, uh, you know, anything like that. What you may want to do is like, just do that. Reach out to them, talk to them and make sure that they feel as if their project is their project and you're just really there to help, right? Um, that gives you a better negotiating sort of position when you have to say, for example, you have to say no to something or you have to give an alternative to something else, uh, to something that they've requested, excuse me. So when you are speaking to the author, and we'll say this again, and we'll repeat more of this uh, later on, is what you really want to do is you want to make sure you're communicating clearly and also that you are showing them that you are trying to you're working with them. You're not working against them. You're not telling them what to do. You're not getting involved in their pedagogy. You're not trying to do that. What you're trying to do is make sure that their work uh, gets the best treatment throughout, you know, editorial and production, and that it reaches um, the most amount of students, the most amount of readers um, as possible. And once an author understands that, then they're not going to see you in an adversarial position, but rather they're going to see you as an asset. And they might even come to you and you might be able to detect things um, a lot easier uh, rather than having to deal with somebody 
you know, that might be afraid that you're going to yell at them or something like that. If you make all that, all of that stuff clear up front, um, it makes your job a lot easier and it makes the author uh, happy because as we've already seen, uh, we're dealing with a lot of things of like licensing and royalties and all that. Uh, one of the things that you can appeal to, as Kathy said, is that social justice point and say, hey, look, we're making this available to people and doing something good for the world and all that. If you are a good project manager and you're able to communicate that effectively, you've already sort of won. So I'm going to hand it over to Mike to talk a little bit more about like scheduling and all that. Again, I repeat, we're not going to get into everything because we have like seven minutes left, but um, I will hand it over to him and stop talking now. Yeah, so I'm not going to cram it all in seven minutes and talk really, really fast. <clears throat> um, just to reiterate what uh, Elvis said, um, and everyone said, <clears throat> sometimes being a project manager feels like you're getting pay paid to nag people, and you kind of are. <clears throat> um, but the emphasis on communication is not just um, volume. I mean, as you saw in the our textbook chapter this week, scribes hit you with a lot of volume there in all those um, betting lists. Um, but the feedback that you're sending to Karen is really what's showing us whether the information uh, is getting through. And the same way <clears throat> when you're managing a project, checking in to ask uh, whether the <clears throat> author understands what you're telling them is vitally important. So the principle that we live by is get a sample. Um, so uh, I understand uh, that uh, Kathy has to uh, draw a boundary and say, come back when your entire manuscript is finished. But another way you can possibly work that, and everyone's gonna have their own needs, uh, is to look at a few sample chapters and you could start the um, authors structuring those chapters with, are they going to have a glossary every chapter? Are they going to start thinking about their uh, quiz questions every chapter while they're writing it rather than finish their entire book that turns out to be a monograph and then have to go back for many more hours, um, restructuring it and adding heads and adding sidebars and adding whatever um, interactive learning parts are appropriate. Um, it might be easier for the author and for you and for what, whoever's doing the copy editing, whether it's us or whether it's someone on your staff, if uh, we understand what the structure is early and they can implement that as they go along. Um, uh, likewise, you'll see uh, in uh, some of those emails, we're often asking for a sample of uh, just send us the first chapter uh, so that we can make sure that we have explained what we need and you've understood what we need. Uh, one trick that I do is I always try to phrase emails in such a way that someone who's very busy can look at my email, understand what I'm saying, and they know what I want from them and they can simply say yes and agree to what I want from them. So it saves them time and it saves me time. Um, Open-ended questions can be nice, particularly in the early stages when you're trying to figure out whether this is a good project, a good fit, whether their project is a good fit for your publishing initiative. Um, but during the nitty gritty, when you're getting into, you need thing X by date Y, uh, open-ended questions aren't very efficient of can you when can you get this back to me is not a good question please get this back to me by march 31st by end of day uh, let me know if there if you cannot meet that date is much more efficient it lets people know uh, what's expected of them it also lets them know uh, that you know what they're what you're doing and that you're on your on their side working for them uh just like elva said and um we're at two minutes to 
I think that's all I want to get into today. Thanks, Mike. Um, so one thing I'll highlight in conclusion is in listening to Carla, Kathy, Mike, and Elvis today, um, you probably noted that your project management will change depending on where the book project is at. So what kind of management is required during the call for proposals, meeting with people early on, kicking off their project, and then while they're writing the project is, is different. It might require a check-in now and then, it might require um, a sample manuscript to review or a sample chapter, but then during production phase, as we heard about in tea time, that's going to require um, some back and forth. Uh, you'll be the intermediary, most likely, between scribe and the author. Although Elvis has told me in the past that if it's helpful, they're happy to be on calls um, directly with authors as well. If um, you're caught in the middle or um, you know, they really wanna hear it directly from scribe, that's something um, they're able to offer. So um, project management time commitment will go up and down depending on where um, you are in the process but um, we are here to support you in that. So we'll talk more about project management as the course goes on. Next week, we're gonna talk about editing and design, the production phase of the book once it's completed. Um, and that's really so that you can get a big picture of what's involved in book production, and we'll um, frame project management within those phases as well. And um, I look forward to seeing you all again soon. If you have questions or concerns in the meantime, uh, let me know. Thank you, Mike, for the reminder. Uh, the homework is a little different for the next meeting. Um, you're gonna be reviewing units four and five, which I know is two units instead of one, um, but really it's just to kind of give you the big picture. You don't need to master all of the content in those two units. Um, but what we would really like you to bring in addition to your takeaways and questions is an example of an instructional book that you consider beautifully and helpfully designed and edited. So it does not need to be a textbook. It could be a textbook, but really we're just looking for something, a, a book or some printed something that taught you how to do something you didn't know how to do previously and just you're gonna share 60 seconds or fewer what you like about it, what you think is effective about it. Again, to sort of support our conversation around uh, structure and design elements to support learning. Any questions before we adjourn about that? And okay, we're at the hour. Uh, see you all again soon. Thanks for your feedback and keep it coming. Bye-bye.